Stephen Jay Gould has been called America's unofficial evolutionist laureate. A professor of zoology and geology at Harvard, he's also written a column for Natural History magazine for the past 27 years. His writing has been credited with making complex subjects such as geology, evolutionary biology, and the history of science accessible to a general audience. Recently, he announced that he will stop writing his column at year's end. His most recent book, The Lying Stones of Marrakesh, is Gould's penultimate book in his series of collected essays from the magazine. As always, I am pleased to have him at this table. Welcome back. Thank you, Charlie. Always happy ah, to be here. Thank you. And let me, why do you stop writing for natural history? Well, it's the Joe DiMaggio, uh, <laughs> Michael Jordan principle. Quit while they still want you. <laughs> Actually, January 2001. Speaking besides, of two heroes of yours. Yes, <laughs> indeed. January 2001, besides being the millennium by half the world's calculations yeah. or 10%, is the month of my 300th continuous essay, having never missed a deadline. If there was ever a, a time that said, if you're going to stop, stop now, <laughs> number 300 at the last possible millennial date. I don't want to be like the aging diva making her sixth farewell <laughs> tour. <laughs> I'm not, not going to stop writing. I'll just stop writing monthly essays. So you'll continue history. to write books and you'll continue, oh, to, okay. sure. you'll continue to teach? Sure. Yeah, you're teaching both at Harvard and uh, here in New Yeah, York. I teach in the spring semester at Harvard and most of the rest of the time at NYU because yeah. I'm in both cities you, now. Your PhD is in paleontology from Columbia, yeah, correct? right. But you teach geology? Well, paleontology is in between the two fields because you need geological methods to find fossils, but their interpretation in the light of evolution is primarily biological. So paleontology has always been trained in both disciplines. The field sits in between. Um, but it's a love affair with fossils. Oh, yes. Yes. Begun <laughs> as for all city boys. Me being a New Yorker is obvious right. from my accent. With me, it started at the Museum of Natural History, which is where I got so you, my you, degree your later. Your father was what? I remember this great story. He your was father? a court stenographer, That's but right. when he came back from his Navy stint in World War II, I was a little kid. He, as a reacquaintance ritual. I actually am one of those New Yorkers who've seen the Statue of Liberty, who's actually been in Grant's <laughs> tomb, believe it or not, where Grant is buried, as Roger yeah, Marx yeah. would have told you. And one of the trips was inevitably yeah. the Museum of Natural History, and when I saw that Tyrannosaurus, I said, that's it. And Did I you really never... say that's it? I mean, it was a lifelong yeah. obsession oh, yeah, no, and I, love affair. I never wavered. My father would say to me when I was a child, he said, you know, because he knew I was stubborn. He said, you know, you don't have to be a paleontologist just because you said you wanted to. But if you want to be, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, The Lying Stones of Marrakesh. Let's just talk about the first one. I mean, where does that story come from? That uh, is the title of this book because it's one of the 30 yeah. or so essays. And I guess it began like most of the essays serendipitously. I was taking a family trip to Morocco. Now, you may know and I'm sure a lot of the readers and watchers will be aware that any time you go into a rock shop anywhere in the world, there are these fossil nautiloids, right. these straight relatives of the modern chambered nautilus that are just ubiquitous in black rocks. They all come from Morocco. I wanted to make sure Morocco wasn't being quarried away, so I made some inquiries. <laughs> One of the things I saw when I was in Marrakech and some of the rock stores there is that a lot of those fossils are outright fakes. They're carved. <laughs> and they're carved in such a way, basically they make a plaster cast. They cut a rock in half and they stick the plaster cast on top and then they, it's very yeah. cleverly done. I wouldn't right. fool a professional. But some of, the pla some of the fakes that are made today in Morocco bear such uncanny similarities to the most famous example of fraud in the history of paleontology, which goes right back to 1726. And so I wrote an essay about the famous lying stones of Wurzburg, which was this 1726 uh, prank played against, uh, not prank, actually, it was an attempt by two of his jealous colleagues to hoodwink and embarrass him against uh, a dilettantish German professor named Beringer. And I was trying to point out that uh, although we can laugh at Beringer because he should have recognized that a spider's web or Hebrew letters yeah. were not real fossils, that after all, in the 18th century, people didn't know how to interpret fossils. You're, you're fossils. revising Beringer's reputation. Oh, yeah. I mean, he does, isn't going to come across as a great scholar, but the point is, in the early 18th century, nobody was sure what if you found a fish in a rock, if you thought the earth was 5,000 years old and rocks were part of the original constitution of the earth, how did it get there? People didn't realize that rocks formed from sediments deposited in lakes and oceans. And, and so it was reasonable if you found odd things in rocks to assume that they weren't true plants and animals, but they were some manifestation of some kind of force in the mineral kingdom that could mimic natural objects. So even to find a sun or a moon or Hebrew letters wasn't necessarily ridiculous. However, in the 20th century, <laughs> to be taken in by identical yeah. fonts for purely commercial motivation is ridiculous, and I was trying to make that contrast. There's also a story in here of Galileo. 
What's that story? Because, and I'm bringing that one up in particular because A, Galileo, but B, you love biography. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think if I've tried to do anything, I've, I've looked back at the inevitably as you age and you come to essay number 300, you try and look back and see are there trends through this series. Now, there's one thing I think I've figured out in writing these. It's to develop a, a style where I try to capture the... Uh, most important intellectual themes of great scientists or not so great scientists' lives within essays. I think it's doable. Obviously, you can write a biography. It's only an essay. But I think you can capture the essence of a person's major contributions and thoughts. And with Galileo, who's one of my heroes, one of any practicing scientist heroes, I really thought it was interesting to focus on his most famous error, which yeah. most people don't talk about. He saw the faces of Venus, he resolved the Milky Way as stars, he saw the moons of Jupiter, he saw the craters of the moon, but when he trained his telescope, which wasn't very good on Saturn, <laughs> he didn't see the rings. First of all, his, he didn't optics, see it. his optics weren't good enough, and I don't think he had any mental space for the notion of a planet with rings around it. So he finally decided that it, Saturn must be a threefold body. It must have a central sphere and two little spheres on the side, because that's how he conceptualized the rings. And the point I was trying to make is that uh, science and theory are not just pure observation. The great scientist isn't just the better observer. Science is a complex, interesting mixture of theory and fact. And here, even this great man, Galileo, with poor optics, he didn't have theoretical space for the notion of a ring around a planet. The <laughs> best he could do was to make an odd conjecture that Saturn was a threefold body. Back to my point, the best way to tell stories is through biography. I think so. His, not, my favorite museums in the world are the Picasso Museum in Paris and the Turner Wing of the Old Tate Gallery in London because they present the lives of these two consummate painters absolutely chronologically. Yeah. That's, that's how you can see. There's nothing better than the chronology of a human and lifetime. And with Picasso, I mean, if you look at his portrait, you can see the evolution of a life. You can see oh, how yeah. he felt about everything. Yeah, and with Turner, you realize these wonderful late paintings, which are so impressionistic or almost modern. He began as a very conservative draftsman, learning the tools and of the trade, learning how to draw in proper perspective. And I think there's something wonderful about that. Is the history of science best told through biography? Not in every subject. It's the way I seem to come to better terms, in part because I'm not a social historian. I can't claim to have strong knowledge of the whole social context of, of a time, but I think I can, because I love to read original works, and I can usually read them in the language they were written in. I, I think I can get a handle on, on a person's writings. And what's the story in here about this British, British uh, J.B.S. Haldane? Oh, yeah, one of the great biologists of the 20th century. Again, it's, it's a, almost the same theme as Galileo. Name what was his mistake? That great scientists can make very great mistakes because they're caught in biases of their social context. Haldane was this wonderful, very eccentric biologist, but he was a leftist, a Marxist, even a member of the Communist Party. Certainly his egalitarian reputation was high. And yet he wrote a book in 1924 praising poison gas. Clinicus saying it was more uh, humane. I mean, war is inhumane, of course. He'd love to see an end of it, but if it has to be war, he thought that uh, p poison gas would not be more destructive ultimately than, than bullets. And he even conjectured, just how wrong scientists can be, that uh, atomic energy could be more dangerous, but the prospect of that ever being done within a hundred human lifetimes to make explosive devices out of it was negligible. <laughs> of course, 20 years later, we had Hiroshima. But the, the error he made was marvelous. Uh, and it shows how egalitarian, though you may be in your soul, in your heart and context, you may still live in a racist world, because he discovered that uh, many African peoples were effectively immune to certain mustard gases. And so he said, all right, now the armies can refurnish themselves with black troops, but all of a sudden he worries who's going to be their officers. It was inconceivable to him that there might be black officers. It's like the quarterback in football, the baseball manager problem all over again. And so this man who supposedly had such good egalitarian instincts says, thank goodness, 20% of whites are also immune, so there will be enough white officers to command these black troops. Never occurring to him. It's like this famous story, which is also true. When the 20th century dawned, 
one of the major European car manufacturers, actually predicted that the automobile would be a successful invention in Europe, but would never be enormously productive or profit-making because there would never be a call for more than a million automobiles at population levels at that time. Why? Because that was the maximum number of people in the lower classes who could be trained as chauffeurs. <laughs> now, if you just think of the errors involved there, first of all, the notion that IQ is a single number, that it's ranked in order through our social classes, yeah. but also the idea that a rich person or a woman would never drive their own automobile. <laughs> so you, you see how stuck we get. Racism and ignorance prevail. Yeah. And we ought to be aware that it's in all of us and we have to always be vigilant. Jim Watson here recently said essentially this. The last half of the 20th century belonged to the physicist. The first half of the 21st century would belong to molecular biologist. That's maybe slightly imperialistic from Jim's own <laughs> profession, but I don't think it's wrong. I, I think it's certainly true that... Uh, with Human genome and all that. ...advances and... Uh, genetic sequencing and identification, the major technological changes, at least of the coming couple decades, are going to be more there. And in information technology, which I confess I don't understand since I still write at a typewriter. You don't? <laughs> no. You, you have not, being man of science, you have not said technology which is such a tool that we can use. It's a great tool. I, I use it in my research all the time. I type on a typewriter. <laughs> but here, you know, here's another, here's a story just today's paper. Cancer study to emphasize the gene's role. This is the own nurture nature thing that's constant. Uh, but it, it, again, it but is about, sorry. But cancer's a whole class of diseases. It's yeah. uh, some of which have strong environmental inputs, others of which, see, I think, but people. This was a story in the New England see, Journal of Medicine, which you know. Hmm. I haven't seen that particular story. But go ahead. But, you know, the only thing I want to say is that cancer is, a, is an enormous class of diseases. It's not one disease. I, I would say cancer is equal in its variety to all the bacterial diseases put together. Bacterial diseases are when foreign agents get into your body. Cancer is when one of your own cells goes slightly awry right. and starts right. proliferating. Cancer is more difficult because it's hard to recognize a slightly altered version of your own cell than it is to recognize a bacterial invader. So... The only thing I'm saying is that I think the cause, because there are so many different cancers, it's a, just a catch-all name for an enormous range of diseases, that some will be strongly environmentally triggered and others will be largely inherited and most will have components of both. And that's partly what they yeah. point at, using yeah. identical twins, that's the point they mm. make in part. But, but giving, recently the sense has been that, you know, genes were destiny, and this was sort of, well, this article in Nearing Journal of Medicine basically says, done by some, I think, forgotten where these scientists were from, basically said, wait, not so fast. Good. I'm you happy know? to see that point being made. Because that is the danger, because the technology is so powerful, it can lead to that exaggerated thinking that everything's in the genes, and exactly. that's clearly not right. Uh, evolution. Have you changed your mind about, it, not about evolution, but about any great scientific precept that you, that you carried away from graduate school and from early academic life? Oh, of course. Uh, well, like what? science is that kind of change. I was Because of new discoveries made you rethink? Oh, what? sure. I was classically trained. I thought in paleontology when I graduated that the history of life was an accumulation of events of natural selection and that mass extinctions, which were recorded in the fossil record, were just an acceleration of the ordinary, maybe because right. climatic change was bigger. And now we know that at least one of the major mass extinctions was triggered by a catastrophic extraterrestrial impact. And yeah. that really Which makes one was you that? The Cretaceous one 65 right. million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs and right. gave us a chance. We wouldn't be here talking today if that hadn't happened because I presume dinosaurs... That was 165... 65 million years ago. 65, yeah. yeah. And mammals had always been around and they had never made any inroads in competition against dinosaurs for 130 million years or so. So if something external hadn't removed <laughs> dinosaurs, I don't think we'd be here. So I think that really causes... that's. Obviously, that's just an explanation for one event, but I think the theoretical implications of realizing that a good part of a lot of the history of life is still controlled by cumulative events of natural right. selection, but to recognize that to understand the whole pattern of life's history, you also have to factor in these occasional environmental catastrophes, which must remove species, and not simply by ordinary uh, Darwinian competition, but right. just by who luckily has features that allow you to get through this catastrophic, unanticipatable sure. episode. Dinosaurs. Uh, I, I just want you to help me this, because I just something I sort of ran past and didn't take notice. They now believe dinosaurs are or are not connected to birds. Well, I think 
consensus would have it that birds are descended from one lineage of dinosaurs, not from the Tyrannosaurus, not from the Brontosaurus, not from the big things, but from the small running carnivores that actually look fairly bird-like to begin with. But I see that's a good mistake people make is to assume that because birds are descendants of dinosaurs, somehow dinosaurs are still alive, there's still Tyrannosaurs around. That makes about as much sense as saying that... Uh, ancient astracoderm fishes are still around because we're here. I mean, we are the descendants of this ancient group of fishes, which has entirely disappeared. Or to say that the sailback reptiles, Dimetrodon, which are the direct ancestors of mammals, are still around because we're here. The point is birds are such different kinds of organisms. Yeah. They're s smaller than any dinosaurs. They fly. They do such different things from any dinosaurs that even though their ancestry may yeah. be a s lineage of dinosaurs, that doesn't mean dinosaurs are still here. It means one small branch of the big tree of dinosaurs evolved very distantly into birds. Finally, evolution. Now, sometimes I, uh, there are two things I want to say finally. One, evolution. I sometimes read these pieces where, where the, the, some of your, some of the evolutionists are quarreling with you. What's oh, that about? That's, that's how just, science it's just works. the nature of science? Oh, sure. There are always things one disagrees with. The main thing I should say, though, is that any healthy field is full of disagreements, but no professional scientist doubts the factual basis of evolution. That the evolution of life occurs, Darwin had it right. is effectively beyond dispute. Oh, I mean, nothing's beyond dispute in science. But let me put it this way. The fact of evolution is as well confirmed as that the Earth goes around the sun and not vice versa. Right. That's, that's all proof can mean. So what's science. the big question in evolution? Oh, the big questions are mechanisms. I mean, how does it happen? What's okay. the pattern of the history of life? Is natural selection every day? Loads of questions. But the factuality of the process is not in doubt. I ask this so frequently. What is the one big question you wish you knew the answer to? It's the conventional one, except I don't know how to get the answer. I really would like to know if there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, <laughs> which is plausible, what it looks like and what they have to tell us about yeah. the nature of things. Because we're probably not very smart compared to what smart could be. Yeah. You talked to your friend Carl Sagan about that. Oh, yeah. Because sure. yeah, he always said it was arrogant of us to assume that there wasn't. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't construct a principled argument about its probability, but the universe is vast, and I figure since we've only been around for a couple hundred thousand years, at most as Homo sapiens, if there are other forms, they might know a lot more than we do, and I'd sure like to get that boost. <laughs> <laughs> this is book is called The Lying Stones of Marrakesh, Penultimate Reflections in Natural History by Stephen Jay Gould. I'll be back for the ultimate one. <laughs> All right, we want to know that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.